Hello guys, welcome to my channel. So today we are going to talk about solid principles and how do we implement solid principles in Java. So this is kind of a good programming practice uh, that we see with a good software engineer. Also, this is a good topic for an interview. So an interviewer can ask you question like, can you uh, explain solid principles and give me an example of where you have or how you have used these principles in your project. So this is an important topic and that is why I'm covering this topic here. So there are five principles in solid. So each letter of solid stands for a particular principle. So first principle is single responsibility. Now what is single responsibility principle? So single responsibility principle in the name is saying that you should have a single responsibility. So in layman terms, it means that whatever code you have written should only be doing one and only one thing only, right? So here you can see that uh, each Java class must carry out one function or responsibility. And that is what we meant by single responsibility. So the implementation of numerous uh, functionalities in one class meshes up the code. So if you have a lot of functionality, then it is going to mash up the code. Also, it is not a good programming practice because if let's say a developer is trying to modify the code, then he will see like uh, there could be at least one changes in your class because you have more than one kind of functionality in your code. So if any changes are needed, then we may have impact on the entire class. So that is what single responsibility means. Now let me give you an example of single responsibility principle. Okay, so now let's say that we have a user class. So user class is going to do a lot of things. So let's say currently we are doing add user and we are doing change email. So these two functionalities are okay if we consider single responsibility principle. But what if we have another functionality check access. So now this check access is not really in particular with this user class because this check access can be uh, can be doing a lot of things like authorization, authentication and tokenization based on um, based on if you have REST API or something like that, uh, maybe hashing, maybe uh, encryption, decryption, right? So it, it, it will do a lot of things. And if we are appending this functionality to this user class, then maybe it won't be justified that we are doing a lot of stuff when it is not actually doing something in generic with user. So what should be done? So single responsibility principle says that the class should have a single responsibility. So this justifies that we are doing something related to user. Now what should happen is we should have two classes. If we comply with single responsibility principle, we should have a class user and then we should have a class user security. So now this user class is going to do two things. One is your add user and change email and this user security is going to just check for access. Now this here is justified because this is particularly related to security and now we have a class doing the same stuff. So this, this justifies our single responsibility principle. So now this should work fine. So here, if we have these three, then the issue are complying with our, uh, these two are complying with our single responsibility, but this is not right. So this is going to be an example of your single responsibility principle. Now let's look at the next one. Okay. Then we have open closed principle. So what does open closed principle say? Open closed principle. Again, we have two term here, which is open and close. So it says that our code or module should be open for extension, but closed for modification. Now, what does this mean? So extension in the name means that, that we are extending or added something new to our already existing thing. But modification means that we are changing the already existing entity. So here, this principle says that you can extend whatever you want, you can extend, but you shouldn't modify your existing code. And that is what this open closed principle mean, right? So now let's take a look at an example, which will show this principle functionality. So taking an example, let's say that we have two class rectangle and then we have circle. 
two classes now I have another main class which is calculating area of rectangle and circle right so here which means that I am having two method one to calculate rectangle area and another to calculate circle area right so here we have two methods but remember that rectangle area is dependent on length and breadth and circles only on radius now these two methods are different but problem is that let's say if I have another shape let's say I have um, rhombus or triangle in that case I have to add another method which is again a pain then let's say I have another shape let's say S1 then again I need another method and so on and so forth I will be modifying this main method so this uh, this main method uh, this main class is not actually extensible it is modifiable which is defying the principle of open and closed principle now what should happen in this scenario so here first we should have a shape interface right so this shape interface is going to have a method let's say calculate area now we will have two method two classes again rectangle and circle now both these two classes will implement shape interface and again implementing calculate area methods now uh, this one's area will be different uh, this one's formula will be different calculation will be different and this one will be different but they both can be different right because that's how interface works now how is this resolving our problem is again we will have our main class now in this main class I can directly call whichever calculate area method I want right let's say I want to call rectangles dot calculate area then I will do something like this so here I'm not modifying the code right because here if I have another uh, let's say shape then that class let's say triangle we have so now this triangle will also implement our shape interface and then it will also have a calculate area method and so on I can have as many as I want and main method is not going to be dependent on how we are actually uh, working here I just need to provide the instance and then I have to just call the calculate area method and then it will provide me a result so this is how you can give out an example or provide an example of open close principle I hope this was clear now let's move on to the next one so the next one is Liskov substitution principle so Liskov substitution principle again it's in a name so there was this person Liskov who provided this principle and this is called as substitution because here we want that let's say if there is an inheritance happening in your code then with inheritance you should have parent class and child classes so any child class should be substituted with your parent class which means that if in case in if in case there is a requirement that um, that we don't want our parent class then we should be able to substitute a child class with our parent class completely and this is what this principle states here it is saying that the derived class should be able to completely substituted by base class without changing the behavior of the program so if it can be substituted completely then the other part of the code won't see any change they will work or behave properly or as expected right so now let's see an example of this principle okay now let's see an example here so I'm taking an example that let's say we have a class board right something something is here now I have to implement this extend this class actually so let's say that I have a class duck which is extending bird right now let's say that we have a method here which is to fly now duck is a bird and duck can fly so here it's okay but what will happen if I have another class ostrich which is also extending bird because ostrich is a bird but can ostrich fly it cannot duck can fly but ostrich cannot fly so here this is defying the list list of substitution principle so if I substitute ostrich 
with bird it will it will never happen right because it cannot replace bird completely and that is what happening here now what should what should we do to cover this scenario or how should we provide a list of example here so here what should be done is we shouldn't have this fly method in our bird class right so this should be empty now there should be another class flying bird and here we can have a method fly so now there are two classes one is our flying bird and another is bird bird doesn't have any method and flying bird has a method fly right so now what we will change is now duck will not implement bird rather it will implement flying bird right so when it will implement flying bird it will be a bird and it can fly so that is justified here and here ostrich is a bird so it cannot fly and it just it is getting justified with this one right because it doesn't have a method so it just it is getting justified that yeah it is a bird so if i replace ostrich with my class bird then it will be justified because it can completely substitute and if i replace duck with flying bird which means that if i replace flying bird if there is no flying bird and if it, if there is only duck then it can also function as a flying bird and we can use it as we were using flying bird and same is the case for ostrich right so this is an example of liskov substitution principle now let's move on to the next one next we have interface segregation so interface segregation means that you should never have a big interface rather you should have smaller smaller ones so what do we mean here is let's say if we have a module which is using a big interface which is having a lot of methods then our classes in that module will be implementing methods which they actually don't require so if we have let's say 100 methods in a in an interface then it is never the scenario that your class will be using 100 methods it could be that it is only using 90 or 80 then it is actually implementing 10 or 20 methods by default which it don't require and that is what this interface segregation principle mean it says that you should let's say my class is only going to need 90 methods in an interface then i will create another interface having those 90 methods and other 10 methods will be in another interface right so i will segregate interfaces in such a way that I, my classes will be implementing methods which they require right so this is what this principle says now let's take an example okay so taking an example let's say that we have an interface let's say management right now this management interface is having methods like let's say add add employee add seat add project right so let's assume that we have these three methods right now what is happening let's say i have class like let's say there is class project manager and then there is this class manager now my manager my manager class is going to do let's say add employee add employee and let's say other stuff like delete employee right and my project manager is doing add project now what is happening let's say my project manager class this class let's say it is implementing my management interface then it has to override these three methods and actually it requires only one add project and same is the case for our manager so manager if it is going to implement management then it only requires add employee method but it has to override all these three so this here you can see that it is a bad example of interface segregation so now what should happen so i should have another interface to let's say seat management and then we should have another one let's say project management now what will happen these three methods are going to be available in these three interfaces so project management is going to have let's say add delete project seat management is going to have let's say add delete seat and employee management is going to have add delete employee 
Now with this what is happening is our manager class is not going to extend a generic interface. It is just going to implement AMP management and it will get the same method which is required, which it basically require. Now for the project manager case, we are going to implement interface project management. And again, it will require this method. So it will get only this method. It won't get another method. So if we have another class uh, for seat management, then again, it will have only one method which it, which it requires. So this is an example of interface segregation. Moving on to the next one, which is the last one, dependency inversion. So dependency inversion says that your code should be loosely coupled. It shouldn't be tightly coupled, which means that our modules should be decoupled. So what will happen? Let's say we have high level modules and low level modules. And if high level module is, uh, let's say it's dependent on low level modules or vice versa, then this is a coupling here. So this coupling should not be there. Rather, there should be some kind of abstraction there. And these both high level and low level modules should be dependent on abstraction rather than on itself, right? So now let's see an example of dependency inversion. Okay, so again, let's take an example of shape, which we have already taken before. So here, let's say that I have my main class and inside my main class, what I'm doing is, let's say I'm just trying to create object of rectangle r equals to new rectangle. Now, this r object is tightly coupled here. How? Because let's say if I have more shapes, then I have to do, let's say a uh, shape. So if I have more shape, then I have to do something like this also, circle c equals to new circle. So this is again tightly coupling. Now, however, or whatever shapes I have, I have to create the instances for them. And let's say I just have to calculate the area. This is what is required. So I have to call this multiple times. So uh, like after R, we have to do something like this also, which is not a good programming practice. Now what should happen here? So here, in my main class. So here I will have another interface shape, which is going to calculate the area for me. Like we will have a calculate area method. And in my main class, what I will do is I will just do shape, let's say rectangle equals to new rectangle. So here we have provided the loosely coupling. So here my code is not dependent on rectangle much rather on shape. So here this calculate area is going to be implemented by all the shapes, like how, like how, how many they are, like it can be n, n shapes. And that is not something that I have to take care of. I have one interface, which is going to be a blueprint or some kind of template for every shape. And they can implement this to, uh, for my main class so that I can calculate the area easily using my shape interface. Right. So shape interface here will not change here. Just I have to change the instance. And this is also an example of spring MVC, like where auto wiring came into existence. So auto wiring also did the same thing, or you can say uh, dependency injection was doing the same thing. Right. So this is also being used there. So this is going to be the example, or you can also say that dependency injection is doing the same thing. And you can explain with any example that you want, like how you have removed the loose coupling with tight coupling. Sorry, I said the positive thing, how ha you have removed the tight coupling with the loose coupling, right? So this is the example of dependency inversion. And this was the last principle. And I really hope that this presentation was clear and crisp and you got all the details like what I wanted to give out. If there is any kind of question, do let me know if you have any feedback also from where like I have improved, then also let me know. And if you have liked this video, don't forget to like and share. And yeah, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And this is it for this video. I really hope that we will meet in some other video. Till then, have a good day, stay safe and bye-bye.